Hirak Summit is fusion of technology in medicine, which is expected to bring about transformative changes in the medical field, thereby revolutionizing it, thus amplifying its importance in today's dynamic world. So let us commence the program and grow our knowledge, which today we have our distinct speakers and guests to guide us and aid us in the same. Before beginning the program, we have a short video presentation.
commence your talk. Over to you, sir. Professionals in the world 
are data scientists. That's data scientists are the persons who analyze this data and come out with the output or the outcome or predict what is going to happen. So data science is the future. So one has to be conversant with data science today. Now this is just again the technicality how this is neural network. This neural network has taken inspiration from brain where there are multiple neurons and these neurons are interconnected. Similarly, these are the nodes which you see, these are the nodes which are interconnected and these are the layers, these are called as hidden layers. So when you have input, this goes to different layers and if they, it is a multiple layers, it is for the deep learning network. If there is a single layer, it could be simple, it could be shallow. So these are the technicalities which of course is not the scope of today's talk. Then type of machine learning, it is a supervised machine learning where the data is labeled. And your example, the unsupervised machine learning where the data is not labeled, partially labeled and reinforced. Again, I won't go into the details. This is too much of a technicality. What is supervised learning? Supervised learning is we tell the machine. So if you give this ECG, you tell the machine, this is P wave, this is QRS complex, P wave. So you tell the machine, so label the data. So this labeling, so it is part of the supervised learning. If you don't tell the machine what it is, then machine itself identify the pattern. So the wave which goes up, so it clubs together. So it classifies by soul. So there is no labeling. It's an unlabeled data. So this is called an unsupervised learning. Most of your our medical today advances in AI are because of the supervised learning. We have to train the uh, machine initially. Then only we can have a desired output. Now, in application regarding this, all sorts of applications that are coming. Many papers have come in different fields. In cardiology especially, uh, echocardiography, ECG, MR, CT endography, all these investigations have been used to derive or predict the future's future. Maybe a cardiac event, maybe uh, arrhythmogenic uh, event, uh, arrhythmias or uh, sudden death. So, many algorithms are in place using different technologies, ECG, ECO, CT angiography and so these have been there and just uh, this is uh, what we are going to see more and more tomorrow. So this is it. But what today I am going to talk about is AI in ECG. Now what AI in ECG does? In machine you give a significant of data significant of ECG data of many patients, different populations and the machine trains itself and then comes out with predictions and we will see how the machine is able to come up with the predictions and what has been done so far, what has been approved and what is uh, more to come. Now this is different from computer. You have to understand how many, there are many computerized ECG uh, machines today and computer itself gives the diagnosis. But here you have to program the computer. You have to give some formula to the computer. For example, if you tell the computer SV1 plus RV6 is more than 35 mm, then it is left into the hypertrophy. So you tell the computer, then the computer will all the PC which will just measure S and R and tell you whether it is LVH or not. So that is the programming of the computer. AI does not work that way. How does AI work? AI you give patients all the information, all ECGs to the patient in whom ECO shows the effect of hypertrophy. So ECO is showing the effect of the hypertrophy and give ECGs of these patients to the computer, this machine. Then machine itself finds out what is common in all this. And then it comes up with its own predictions. So you don't tell machine what is common. You, the machine itself finds a pattern what is common in all these patients where ECO proven LVH is there. So the, here the accuracy is very high. Unlike computer generated uh, uh, output where many times you have false positive. Many times you see there is LVH but patient does not have LVH. Many patients don't have LVH but computer says there is LVH. So there is a high positivity, false positivity and negativity in computer uh, uh, based uh, uh, predictions. But in AI based predictions you have a very high accuracy. So that is very important. So AI predictions are more accurate. 
Now how does AI do? This way. Now when we see ECG, we see ECG as P, Q, R, H, T. So if there is abnormality in P, abnormality in Q, R, S, abnormality in T, then we diagnose certain things. AI doesn't work that way. We see ECG like this, AI sees ECG like this. So for example, now this is lead 1. Lead 1 is represented in digital format in 5000 rows. These are only 35 rows which I have displayed because of the shortage of space. But for lead 1, there are 5000 points for lead 1. So for 12 leads, there are 60,000 points. So when AI sees this, AI sees, sees this as 60,000 points. And if it finds a pattern, then it makes that these two ECs are similar in this pattern, which our human eye cannot see. We can see only PQRS. But AI, AI has a different type. AI sees this in a different map, is in a different way. So this is how it has drawn its own conclusion in a different manner. Now these are different applications which I will go into detail. Now the first predictions or diagnosis of AI in using ECG was for left, detecting left ventricular dysfunction. Now most of the data which I am going to present today has come from Mayo Clinic. The group of workers from the Mayo Clinic and it is a, with great pride I can say that just a few months ago I organized a conference, national conference of ECG here <coughs> where Dr. Samuel Asseberthas from Mayo Clinic flew all the way from Minneapolis to Solapur to attend this conference for one and a half day and went back to Minneapolis. And it was a very proud moment for me to present this lecture AI ECG in front of him. So, most of the work in AI ECG, the credible work that has been done today in the world has come from Mayo Clinic, that group. Now this is their first uh, work where around 50,000 ECG echocardia players were used for training AI. AI. So AI is trained. So ECG are given to the machine, yeah. then it learns and then it comes up with predictions. Then you use that algorithm which AI has learned to a different uh, group of patients which is called as a validation. Then you use it in different population that is called as a testing. So it is in different phases. So now here the testing was the over 50,000 ECG in whom ECO was available. And then the ECG was used to tell whether the ejection fraction was less than 35% or more than 35%. See ECG is going to tell you whether the patient has a left ventricular dysfunction or not. This is a big deal. See many places don't have echocardiogram. Just imagine with ECG if you are able to tell whether the patient has left ventricular dysfunction or not. A patient comes in casualty with dyspnea and you have only ECG with you and if you are able to tell when this is left ventricular failure, see how big information you are going to get. Now with this, it was able to come up with uh, this sort of uh, uh, ROC. Now for those who are not familiar with ROC, this is this is your operating curve. The more the curve towards the left upper corner, more accurate the findings of that test are. So this algorithm which ECG used for left ventricular dysfunction had a very high accuracy to the tune of 93%. The area under the curve was 93%. So very high accuracy, 93% accuracy and ECG could say whether the patient had left ventricular dysfunction. Now this is an interesting slide. You have to now this was a patient. This is slightly burnt. That doesn't matter. This was a patient whose eco ejection was 50 percent. So it was a normal left ventricular function. But AI told that this patient is likely to have is positive for low ear. This patient is likely to for low ear. So at that time. It was labeled this was false positive. A has wrongly diagnosed this as low ejection fraction. This ECG 
to any human eye, in the best of the cardiologists, it will label as a normal. But AI said that this patient has a low ejection fraction. And this was labeled at that time as false positive. So this is wrong, AI is wrong. But five years down the line, five years down the line, this patient developed left ventricular dysfunction. So this ECG acted like a horoscope. Astrologer, this patient ECG predicted whether the patient will develop left ventricular function later. So ECG is like an astrologer, it predicted. So a new concept has come where a, pre a prevailed concept has come where is whether ECG can predict a disease which is going to happen in future. See how big thing it is. It is not only diagnosing whether the patient has a left ventricular dysfunction, it can predict whether the patient will have a left ventricular dysfunction later. So a new concept of prevailed was put forth by the same group, Mayo group. And so and it has been shown that probably we can predict a patient whether the patient will have left ventricular dysfunction or not. So for systolic dysfunction, similarly the paper has come out from a different group where ECG can also diagnose diastolic dysfunction. So with a very high and uh, sensitivity and sensitivity to the tune of 80%. Now, if you are given this ECG and asked whether the patient has a normal ejection fraction or a low ejection fraction. Again, I don't think even if the best cardiologist here can tell uh, what is the ejection fraction of this ECG? At the best bits here, in fact, I have been taught is to, if we have to look for a left ventricular dysfunction in ECG, we will look at the P PTF, P terminal force, left ventricular dilatation. And that might give us little idea whether the LV function is impaired or not. But this PTF function is not great. So, what is the problem of LV dysfunction of ECG? When it, this ECG was given to AI, it said that the ejection fraction low ejection fraction, the probability is 76%. So that ECG is likely to have a low EM and patient's EM was 18%. So ECG accurately diagnosed the low ejection fraction in this patient. Now, this interesting paper has come down. There is a stethoscope which is ECG level. So with a stethoscope, you can obstruct it, but also record a single read ECG. Now, if this algorithm is put in that uh, uh, ECG, if it is integrated with the ECG, in casualty itself, while recording the ECG, auscultating, you will know whether the patient will have left ventricular dysfunction. This is another great leap. Now, second application of AI to detect silent atrial fibrillation. Now, this is a lady, 65 year old lady. She had a cerebral aspirin episode in 2014. She did not have obvious risk factors, diabetes, hypertension, lipids, everything was normal. So most probably many times we believe that it could be because of intermittent atrial fibrillation and thrombolipid event. Coulter was done, there was no air, so she was not anticoagulated. She presented with another CVA few years later. Again the Coulter was done, did not have atrial fibrillation. Then few months later she had a and now she was put on antibiotics. Now imagine if we could predict if whether this patient had having silent antibiotics, then we could have started antibiotics early and prevented that stroke. Can we predict it? Now this is the patient. This patient's ECG was recorded. Here in 2008, this ECG was subjected to AI and was told that this is a normal sinus rhythm, some ventricular ectopics, but there was no silent AF. So there, this patient is not having intermittent atrial fibrillation. 2008. In 2013, again, if you compare these ECG, these two ECGs are identical, same patient. Five, five years later, Except there are no BPCs. Again, silent rhythm, but here the AI is saying this patient has silent atrial fibrillation. This is remember this is a si normal sinus rhythm, and AI is saying this patient has silent atrial fibrillation. Patient is developing intermittent atrial fibrillation, 
and this patient, six years later, developed atrial fibrillation. So AI predicted the atrial fibrillation early. So this the persistent atrial fibrillation. So intermittent atrial fibrillation. No amount, no investigation today, including on the long term monitoring, hold term monitoring, anything can diagnose atrial fibrillation. See if you can diagnose, predict this atrial fibrillation, those stroke events can be prevented. See how much morbidity, if you can prevent the stroke, how much morbidity you can prevent. So that's the importance of AI ECG where you can detect a silent air and prevent a future event. Now this was done again from the same Mayo group with the over 4 lakh ECGs they uh, they, uh, they developed an algorithm using more than 4 lakh 50 thousand uh, ECGs where 8 percent patients had atrial fibrillation and uh, testing was done and again the prediction was with a very high accuracy see the ROC going up to the left to the upper corner uh, more than 86 percent accuracy so silent air with their algorithm they say can detect can be detected with a very high accuracy even if the patient doesn't have atrial fibrillation at time the patient is in sinus rhythm you can diagnose silent air or intermittent air and uh, maybe that can help the patient now how can, how does this the ai uh, do this before actual persistent atrial fibrillation is develops the heart has some structural abnormalities like high LA dilatation, fibrosis, myofascial fibrin, so many things are there. And these things can produce some changes in electrical activity, which those 60,000 points of which AI sees, there might be some abnormality in that, those 60,000 points. And then the, uh, it can come out with some pattern which can say that this patient has AI. And this can be exemplified. Many times it has been observed that during transition of the echocardiography, while rest of the atria are contracting normally, the appendage is showing fibrillation. This is not picked upon routine ECG. Routine ECG shows the sinus rhythm because majority of the atria is contracting normally, but the appendage is showing fibrillation. So part of the uh, atria is fibrillating and probably this our routine EC is not able to pick up that focal uh, abnormality. The AI is able to pick up that focal abnormality. Now the next application, AI ECG for detecting hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Then again, uh, same group, Mayo group, uh, with over 63,000 patients. Again, using uh, this large data, they have come up with the other algorithm to diagnose hypertrophic cardiomyopathy on ECG alone with a very high uh, sensitivity and specificity. See the ROC again going to the left upper corner. Now again this is an interesting uh, ECG. If you see this ECG, I don't think we can diagnose hypertrophic cardiomyopathy with this ECG. None of the cardiologists will be able to diagnose hypertrophic cardiomyopathy on this ECG. But when AI was given this ECG, it diagnosed AI ECG probability of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is 72 percent on this ECG. What is more interesting is this patient underwent surgery for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. My turn. And the ECG was recorded and given to AI. Then AI says the pro pro probability of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is only 2.5 percent. So again, this ECG we will not be able to clinically diagnose HCM, but AI is able to see. Our human eyes cannot see. Now, this is a 23 year old who came with syncope. Obviously, the ECG is normal. There is no apparent cause for syncope on this ECG. And we could have subjected the patient to a multitude of investigations and came out with no apparent cause. When AI was given this ECG, it said there is a 72.6% this patient has hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So we get the cause of syncope on using of EC. This is how AI is useful. Now, not only AI can diagnose hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. As you know, in echocardiography, when you see hypertrophy, 
This hypertrophy, you cannot distinguish on EPO itself whether this hypertrophy is because of hypertension, this is because of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, this is because of amyloidosis, or whether this is because of aortic stenosis, or it is just a physiological athlete's heart. All hypertrophies look very much similar on EPO cardiomyopathy. It is there, we are not able to distinguish. However, AI can distinguish if these images are given to AI with ECG. If ECG images are given to the AI, then ECG itself is going to tell you whether this hypertrophy is because of which condition, aortic stenosis, hypertension, amyloidosis, and with a very high sensitivity and specificity. So it is very useful how AI is going to help us in this way. Now this is another interesting concept, AI ECG and biological age. Now with ECG you can tell the age of the patient and sex of the patient. The sex of the patient, see the, you can see the ROC, very accurately it can detect sex of the patient, if the patient is a male or a female, looking at the ECG, you, you can tell the sex of the patient. Similarly, with ECG, you can tell the age of the patient, only on ECG. Now we are going further. Now, this same Mayo group, they postulated that the ECG predicted by AI tells you not the chronological age, but the biological age of the person. So, patient might be having multiple diseases and he must be actually 60 while his chronological age is 40 because of his life expectancy might be limited. And probably ECG is telling you that age, not his chronological age. This is the concept which has been put forth and this was tested. Now, in AI ECG records the age, if you see the patients who have social isolation, AI ECG age is more. If they have acute illness, AI ECG is more than the chronological age. If they are obese, their age is more. So, so and so forth. So, AI ECG is more than the chronological age. Now, this was tested and a concept was, has come as age gap. If you see patient's chronological age and the age determined by AI, the difference between two age is called as age gap. So if age gap is more, if the chronological, if the biological age is more than the chronological age, then they have a, it has been shown that they have a very high mortality over the years. So the AI ECG is able to predict the life expectancy. Now this is the study which has been put forth. Now if the age graph is more than 7 years, this is the graph. See, this is the cumulative gap. If the age gap is more than 7. If the age gap is less than 7, then hardly difference between the uh, two groups. So AI ECG which tells you the actual biological age can tell you what is the life expectancy of that uh, now this is another interesting issue. This is a lady. Her age, the, her weight was 106 kg with a BAM of 39.2, age of 34 years. But the AI ECG age was 40.8 years. So there was a 6 years gap. This was the issue. Six age gap was 6 years. Over the next 2 years, she lost her weight. She lost her weight from 160 lost 10 days to 96 days. Now AI ECG was 36. So the age gap was 0. So just by losing weight, her biological age has come down. If, if you see these two ECGs, for our eyes, these ECGs are identical. But AI told you that her biological age has reduced. She has become younger just by losing 10 cases. So this is how AI is going to give you much more information than what we can say. This is another interesting, in fact this is the slide which I picked up from Dr. Fred, from again from my own group, when he was giving a lecture, very interesting, very extremely interesting. Now, this is the chronological age and this is ECG age. See these patients. The chronological age was around 40, 
the ECG age was about 55. Over the years, the chronological age increased. ECG age also increased over the years, till the age of 53. The chronological age increased, ECG age increased. Then suddenly, ECG age decreased. Patient became younger, ECG wise. He asked the audience, what has happened? Why the ECG age has decreased? Why, why has it decreased? When he asked, some gave a funny answer. They said, he got married. Some said the opposite answer, he got divorced. So, these were the funny answers that he got. But you know what actually happened? He went, underwent heart transplantation. And he got the heart of a younger person. That's why his biological age went up. So this is how ECG can take your biological age with, and which is different from your chronological age and how much your body has aged. So this is going to be our dashboard. This is the again Mayo Clinic's dashboard. Just to summarize here. Now today we have ECGs. Most of the machines tell you what is the PI meter, what is the rate and probably there are also diagnosis here. What is QT, QTC here. But now we AI algorithm, you are going to have this also. What is his biological age? What is ECG sex, that is a male or female? What is estimated ejection fraction? What is the probability of low ejection fraction? What is the probability of silent air? And what is the probability of hypertrophic cardiac? So with ECG, you might get this additional info, very useful information, very critical information that you cannot get, get otherwise. Now, some other applications for pulmonary hypertension. As you know, the primary pulmonary hypertension, the mortality is very high, and if you don't detect it early, then the mortality further increases. And the good treatment you can reduce the mortality, increase the life expectancy. And our conventional ECG, we use the CATRA for conventional ECG to diagnose pulmonary hypertension, pre-pulmonal, right axis, RBA, HRB strain. The sensitivity, the sensitivity. The maximum is 34%. For conventional ECG is not able to pick up pulmonary hypertension. But see the AI ECG. With AI, you have 88% area under curve. With 88% nearly accuracy, you can diagnose pulmonary hypertension. And not only that, it can tell you if the AI says you have pulmonary hypertension, AI ECG says you have pulmonary hypertension, then you are likely to have a high cardiovascular and normal cause mortality. So AI ECG in pulmonary hypertension patients can tell you about the mortality, uh, all cause mortality as well as the cardiovascular mortality. Similarly, in aortic stenosis, it can diagnose the aortic stenosis, it can tell you the severity of aortic stenosis. Not only in cardiac, many non-cardiac conditions also it can be diagnosed by AI ECG. New onset diabetes, hyperthyroidism. It can estimate potassium levels using AI ECG, anemia, cirrhosis. So, so many papers are coming up for these conditions. Now, all these are in the research <coughs> academics. Is it clinically applicable? Can we bring this into practice? That is the big question. Now, the first trial, the Eagle study, was used for clinical application of AI ECG in left and dysfunction. And the results have come out, AI ECG integrated into primary care did improve the diagnosis of low ejection fraction. So this was the first study which showed that he used ECG to predict left ventricular dysfunction in a large group of patients. It was useful. So their algorithm or Mayo Clinic algorithm was useful for detecting LV dysfunction and changing the course of the treatment in the patient. For the silent case anticoagulation, the study is still on the recruitment and their results are not yet out. AI, it is not all rosy, everything positive. AI has its challenges. AI has its problems. What is the professional language? Now, if you integrate this in day to day, -to -day practice, AI says patient has silent AF and you start anticoagulation, patient bleeds. Patient bleeds. And patient never developed anticoagulation. Who is responsible? The treating physician? The person who developed the algorithm? Who is responsible? 
So we don't know who is responsible, the professional liability. Because we are just <coughs> relying on AI capability, not any human. That patient has silent air, you have not seen the silent air. Because AI said there is silent air, you are printing it. And that has caused harm. So that is a problem. Now AI is as good as the data. It is all data, data, data. If you give a good data, you have good algorithm. You have good prediction. If you don't have a good data, then you don't have a good prediction. So you have to have a good data, high quality data. Now, similarly, you have to have varied data. Whatever is true in American population may, but may not be true in Indian population. We have rheumatic heart disease. Our causes of active populations are different. Whatever the algorithm there may not be applicable here. So it should be universally applicable. Then because ultimately it is a software, it is prone to be hacked. Just imagine that software is hacked and someone manipulates the software. And for a patient, it says, even if the patient doesn't have attitude, it says that this patient has attitude It can manipulate. So you can have tremendous problems at hand. Then the ECG data, with the ECG data, you have different machines, different ECG data. Collection of ECG data itself is a big challenge. Some have paper ECGs, some have digital ECGs, some have computerized ECGs. All machines are different. Standardization is different. So that is a big challenge. And you have to have very high quality ECG data. So there are so many things. I can give you an illustrative example. How input data is very important to medical patients. Very interesting. Now if you see this ECG, for us, this is a single ECG. Okay, if you magnify this P wave here, in fact there are two overlapping ECGs. This P wave, there are two overlapping. One is a blue color and one is a red color. When blue color ECG of this was given to AI, it said that this patient ECG, the patient is likely to be made. This ECG, ECG when given, patient is likely to be made. But you introduce some oscillation, some vibrations in ECG and red color ECG and give this to air, the machine says this is a female. So little vibrations here can totally make opposite predictions. For a human eye, it is same. Okay, but AI is different. So this is how it is different. For, for ECG, the MD, US FDA approval is for adverse preparation. These companies have got approval, Apple has got approval, Allied Power has got approval, Petroni has got approval of that. Now you will see here, most of this data has come from Bioclaim. You will see, most of the data has come from the Bioclaim. With over 49,000 12-bit DC. But what you will see here is, there is no Indian data. We and unless you have a good Indian data, then you cannot make predictions. So you have to have our data to make our predictions. You will see here there is no Indian data. So I decided to take a baby step in AIC. Because we don't have Indian data. I have a data of electronic medical record of over 55,000 patients over the last 20 years. Then I have ECG data of over 1.5 lakh digital ECG with at least one ECG per patient. I have this in my computer record. And all the ECGs in my patients are in digital format. Of these 55,000, the clinical diagnosis is available in over 99% of the patients. Echocardiography report is available in more than 90% of the patients. Blood pressure and anthropometric data is available in 95% of the patients. So I have this data over the last 20 years with the follow-up of these patients. In addition, I also have series of over 40,000 angiograms which I have done over the last 25 years. I have series of all these patients. And of 8,000 angioplasties which I have done over the last 25 years. I have studied all this and I am uh, uh, accumulating that data and using the images and trying to collaborate with different agencies to see if I can develop any algorithm. So I use, try to use this 
data for some preliminary predictions by 50,000 patient data. First, I use this data whether I can predict the age of the uh, sex of the patient. And I found that with my ECG data, I was able to identify the sex of the patient with 85% accuracy. With AUC was 90 fairly accurate with my ECG, I was able to uh, identify the sex of the patient. Now about the age, again, I could diagnose the, uh, uh, estimate the age of the patient with 92% of the uh, in, uh, accuracy in my patient of 55,000. Of course, I use only 400 patient data to uh, estimate the age of the patient. If I use a larger number, maybe the accuracy will go up. It's just initial study. Now, then I can bolder with these two. So I decided to uh, do something prediction, some new predictions, which were not reported so far in the literature. So I used my ECGs for this, for left bundle branch block. As you know, left bundle branch block can be a normal in certain patients or can be a marker of a structural heart disease, coronary heart disease or directed cardiac disease. So whether on ECG itself, can we tell whether this LVVB is a normal LVVB or LVVB because of the structural problem that I decided to test on my patients of ECG, LVVB. LVVB prevalence use is 3.2 in 10,000 patients. Now, I had 317 patients out of 55,000 who had LBVP and who had underwent at least one echocardiogram and coronary angiogram. Yeah. So, those 317 patients I chose for analysis. Out of which 117 patients had obstructive coronary artery disease, 97 patients had left ventricular dysfunction, and 103 patients didn't have any obvious heart abnormality. Then I gave, him, gave this data to a data scientist and he came up with a prediction. And with 83% accuracy, 81% accuracy, my ECG would be able to, I was able to tell that whether this LPPP is a normal LPPP or this LPPP was because of underlying heart problem in my patients. So, this is a baby step which I am taking and now I am presenting. I am trying to collaborate with different agencies, trying to analyze, get more algorithms. Uh, in place uh, to explain it because we don't have much of Indian data so see if uh, we can formulate some algorithm in Indian population and I have to acknowledge the help of these persons who contributed for my analysis. Thank you. this size and now you can use a machine of this size 
to record a six leads. It is very easy, simple possible. Dr. Parade, I am really proud of you because Dr. Parade, uh, Deepak Agra Purkar and CK Pohde, these are the three people who are at the national or not even national, at the international level. And don't call this as a baby step. What you are doing in AI is done by nobody in the country. This is a real adult step. Please keep it up and take more collaboration from others. It will be really useful. kind of gadgets, please wait after the conference is over. Thank you sir for sharing your wonderful views and enlightening us on this topic. The floor is now open to respected chairperson. Yeah, I am uh, really, really honored to be uh, part of this discussion. Uh, Alwar sir, Koye sir, these are uh, the people whom we have idolized during our medical schools. Uh, and I have heard this talk before uh, in the national conference which sir just mentioned. And, uh, we feel proud that somebody uh, at a place like Sulapur is, you know, uh, trying hard to, you know, catch up with the international level. So, great sir. Thank you. We request the chairpersons to kindly come on the stage and felicitate our guest of honor, Dr. Gurudhar Paraya, sir. Thank you, sir.